thanks so much for letting me come and speak. So I'm going to be talking about the serverless LAMP stack. And this is basically all about how to use PHP in AWS Lambda to build scalable serverless applications without thinking about servers. Um, so just quickly to set the context uh, about why, uh, how I've sort of come in front of you to speak today. Um, I uh, am a senior developer advocate at AWS and I work with builders and uh, developers to help them to understand how best to build applications with service technologies. What that also means is I'm kind of a voice internally to make sure that we're building the best services and the best products and features for those uh, customers and those developers. Before coming to AWS two years ago, um, I was a web developer and a technical program manager for a number of different years. And I've worked at all sorts of different size companies from large global enterprises to uh, tiny startups in the world of software and business automation. And I've been a PHP developer for about 15 years and more recently uh, using and talking about serverless technologies for a number of years, helping developers to understand how to apply their workloads to serverless. So please do feel free to contact me on Twitter. My uh, name is Benjamin underscore L underscore S if there's any questions that pop up after this talk that we don't manage to, to get to. And also over the course of this uh, little talk here, there'll be this QR code that pops up um, with uh, various links. So you could link on to uh, further information on some of the topics that I'm gonna cover um, to get more, more data, more information, code samples and stuff like that. So why are we here? Well, mainly to address a challenge that's commonly associated with traditional applications. And that challenge is scalability. So a nice analogy that I like to use to explain this problem is to imagine that one person needs to travel from uh, their home to a birthday party, and they might use a bike as a sufficient mode to transport uh, themselves there. If they need to travel with another person, then a bike might be too small, and instead they need a taxi. Let's say four people need to travel together, and then they'd need a bus, and so on and so forth. This is an example of what's called vertical scaling. So each increase in load requires the purchase of a larger transport mode to bear that load. And this method of scaling is what's applied to the traditional lamp stack model. What it means is that each time a server starts to reach its capacity limits, an additional server will be required to increase that load capacity. And each additional server brings additional overhead with things like networking, administration, storage capacity, backup and restore systems, and you might have to update some sort of asset management inventory. And because each server has its own disk and its own file system that runs independently, you'll often run into synchronization challenges. Now, coming back to that same analogy, imagine the same four people each travel using a bicycle. This way, the load is more evenly spread and it's far more flexible because as traffic grows, you can add an additional capacity unit. And this is called horizontal scaling, and it's what allows serverless technologies to scale flexibly. So what this means in practice is that if traffic surges, the services will scale to meet the demand without having to deploy additional services. And that's what allows applications to really quickly transition from prototype straight into production. So now is a really good time for PHP developers to take another look at service technologies. So you've probably heard the term serverless being floating around for a few years now. Um, and it's not been a very easy thing for PHP developers to onboard into, but that's actually changed over the last 12 months or so. And to understand why that's changed, I think it's useful to look at the timeline of events that's led up to today. So going back to November of 2014, this brand new service called AWS Lambda is announced. And this is a compute service that runs code in response to events. And what it does is to automatically manage uh, the compute resources and automatically scale for you. We'll go into Lambda in some detail in, in just a second. A year later, in July of 2015, was this service called Amazon API Gateway. And this enables developers to build secure and scalable APIs really quickly in front of a variety of different types of architectures. Then in 2017, we launched something called Aurora Serverless, 
And this was a new configuration that allowed developers to pay for RDS database resources on a second by second basis. So moving it more towards a serverless payment model. Then probably the most significant release for this particular talk was in uh, 2018, where we launched something called Layers and the Custom Runtime. So the Custom Runtime allows developers to build pretty much any language to Lambda, and they're able to share that language or that runtime um, with something called a Lambda layer. And we'll talk about how you can do that in just a sec. Then in September of 2019, there were some great improvements made to those Lambda function startup times that run inside a VPC or a virtual private cloud. And then in November of 2019, we launched this service called RDS Proxy, which is a fully managed and highly available database proxy for relational databases. So that makes it uh, applications that use relational databases more scalable, more resilient to database failures, and more secure. So this is the serverless lab stack. You will notice that Linux is replaced with Lambda and Apache is replaced with API Gateway. And of course, you still have MySQL and PHP. But before I dive into the serverless lab stack, I think it's useful to really define what I mean when I keep saying this word serverless, because it's been you know, a kind of um, trendy term in the industry for a few years now, but it, it sometimes means different things when it's said in different ways. At AWS, we define serverless as something that fulfills all four of these key tenants. So the first is that there should be no infrastructure to provision or manage. So that means no servers to spin up, nothing to operate, nothing to patch, no physical or virtual container orchestration of any kind. The next is that it should automatically scale by unit of consumption. So that means not scaling by adding an additional server each time or additional container, but rather, than, uh, but rather scaling by um, the amount of traffic that it needs to service. The third is that there should be a pay for value billing model. So you could say that not paying for idle. It means you only pay for execution duration rather than the, uh, the unit of server that you're using. And the fourth is that it should be highly available and secure. So it has built in availability and fault tolerance. So there's no need to architect for that because it's baked into the service. So when we say serverless, what we're talking about is the removal of all those server related operations. And that's the important distinction for customers because it allows them to focus on building the application um, in the business logic, in the code from a prototype to production, rather than managing and scaling that infrastructure that their application sits on. So that brings me straight to Lambda, the L of our new serverless Lambda stack. And like I said, Lambda is a compute service that runs code that you upload to it in response to events. Um, and Lambda doesn't just sit in a vacuum. Typically, it will form part of a whole service application with two or three components. You have the event source, the Lambda function, and the destination for the function to connect to. So the event source is the thing, the event, that tells the Lambda service to start running your Lambda function code. And there's a number of different services that can directly interact with Lambda. It could be a change in a database state or an upload to an S3 bucket or a direct request from an HTTP endpoint. Again, the important thing to remember is it's the, the thing that tells the Lambda service to start running your function code. Then you have your Lambda function. And uh, this provides a curated execution environment with a number of languages natively supported. And like I mentioned before, you can use the runtime API to run pretty much any language in, inside of Lambda. Then there's the destination or the service. And this can be whatever your code needs to interface with. It's, it's entirely up to you and your business logic and your application requirements. So at the function level, there's a few interesting pieces of Lambda that are unusual when you first look at it. You have something called the Lambda function handler. And here you can see a screenshot of two different Lambda function handlers. Um, on the left is a Lambda function written in PHP, and on the right is a Lambda function written in Node.js. Um, and they do pretty much the same thing. They both have something called uh, an index handler. Um, the PHP version is called index underscore handler. And this is the, uh, the first thing that starts running code in your Lambda function. 
It's the first thing that's executed upon invocation, if you like. And you'll notice that there's two parameters or two arguments that are provided uh, to that function. The first is the event object. And uh, this contains information about the event that invoked your Lambda function to start running in JSON format. So, for example, an API request event will hold information about that HTTP request object. Then you have the context object, and this is used less frequently, but it's really useful because it contains information about the invocation itself. And it provides uh, methods to allow you to interact back with the runtime and the execution environment. Then you'll notice above the handler are things like the functions dependencies, some configuration options, you can put helper functions and so on. And it's where your function might initialize database connections, for example. Now, Lambda, like I said, is designed to run code on demand in response to events. And if you look at the anatomy of a Lambda function, you'll see there's a few different layers. And you can go from the outermost ring in. So first, there's the Lambda compute substrate. And that's the underlying compute for all of Lambda. Next, there's the Lambda service itself, which manages it, the scaling and the organization of workloads across hundreds of thousands of customers. And both of those two layers are completely invisible to the customer. They're managed entirely by AWS. Then the next layer in is the execution environment, and that's customer specific and AWS account specific. And it's the secure space where your code is run. Then inside of that is the execution environment. Uh, that's where your language runtime uh, is, is run. And then finally, there's your function itself. And that's the code that you provide um, zipped up with any dependencies that are needed. I'll come back to Lambda and how you run PHP in Lambda, but just briefly want to show you what API Gateway is. So I'm sure you've heard it said before that APIs are kind of the front door to your, your backend architecture. And there is this service called Amazon API Gateway, which is huge. It, it's fully managed service that makes it really easy to create and maintain and secure APIs at any scale. And these APIs are then used to access data and business logic or pretty much any functionality from your backend services. And you can do that with RESTful APIs or WebSocket APIs. And it's a very big comprehensive uh, service, but some feature highlights that I always pull out that it's great for communicating between microservices. It has built in protection from DDoS attacks and throttling for your backend architecture. And you can configure to authenticate and authorize every single call made to an API endpoint. So then there's the M, and this is MySQL, which is running on Amazon Aurora using Amazon RDS proxy. Now, Aurora is our cloud native database service that's still the fastest growing service in AWS history. So um, relational databases are not going away anytime soon. And you have a database instance here that's created inside a virtual private cloud or a VPC, which keeps it nice and secure and prevents uh, public access. And you can connect to your Aurora database instance from a Lambda function, and that Lambda function must be also configured to access that same VPC. And this provides high performance and availability for MySQL databases, and the underlying storage scales automatically to meet up to 64 terabytes, which is over 70,000 gigs. And there exists a fairly new feature called RDS proxy. So this is a database proxy that lets you pull and share database connections to uh, improve your application scaling. So before RDS proxy, a, a common problem that customers were experiencing was that database memory, memory exhaustion was occurring when connecting directly to their relational database. And that was caused by a surge in database connections or by a large number of connections that were opening and closing at a really high rate. If you can imagine hundreds or thousands of Lambda functions or uh, concurrently trying to connect to the same database instance, it was leading to slower queries and limited application scalability. So RDS Proxy built this service to solve that problem. Um, and it establishes a database connection pool that sits between your application and your relational database or sits between your relational database and your Lambda function. And it reuses connections in that pool. So that protects your database against oversubscription without a memory and CPU overhead of opening and closing a new connection each time. And it also adds an extra layer of security because the credentials for your database can then be stored 
uh, nice and securely in Secrets Manager and they're accessed via an AWS IAM role. So that enforces good, strong authentication requirements. And this is the token dance that you do when you connect to an uh, Amazon Aurora database from a Lambda function. The connection is made from the Lambda function that runs PHP. The Lambda function connects to the database via RDS proxy, and the database creden credentials that RDS proxy uses are held in Secrets Manager and accessed via an IAM role. So this is the meat of what I wanted to talk about is PHP running on Lambda. As PHP developers, we know that 80% of the web is still running on PHP because it's still a great language for building web applications. Uh, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Sadly for AWS, they don't natively support PHP in Lambda, no matter how much I ask them. But the good news is, is that it's now really easy to run PHP inside of Lambda. And not just PHP, by the way, you can do this with any Linux compatible runtime. Um, what you do is you use something called the Runtime API uh, to make a custom runtime, and then you can distribute that as a layer or as a container image. And if you if you use the uh, custom if you use the API to create a custom runtime, you need to use a special file called a Bootstrap. And this Bootstrap file acts as an interpreter or acts as a, a bridge between the handler function and the Lambda execution environment. It tells the Lambda service how to understand PHP. And it uses the runtime API and some key environment variables to kind of form this bridge. And this bootstrap file is responsible for processing the inbound events and headers. It has to initialize the function and invoke it. And it also needs to handle the function response and include any errors that occur. And finally, it should manage the function cleanup as well. Lambda runtime that several environment variables during the initialization. Most of those environment variables provide information about the function or the runtime. And the keys for these environment variables are reserved. So you can't accidentally overwrite them. And I've pulled some of them out here. So there is an environment variable which holds the host and the port number of the runtime API endpoint that you need to connect to. There's one that holds the handler name, remember the function handler? And there's one that holds the directory uh, path to that function handler. And the best way to understand that is this uh, bootstrap file. This is a really simple implementation of a bootstrap file, which works, and you can try it from this link here. This is all you need to run PHP in Lambda. So here you can see each of those things happening. First, it's processing the inbound event and headers. It's initializing the function and invoking it using the environment variable. Um, and here it uses the environment variable to know what the handle function is called. And it also needs to handle the function response and include any errors that occur. So a common question that I get at this point is, how do you manage different versions of PHP? How do you use different modules or different package dependencies? Um, and that's a really good question. And the answer is it depends if you're using Lambda functions packaged as a zip file or Lambda functions packaged as a container image. So first we'll look at using a zip file to package your Lambda functions. This is what you have to do. You have to literally go into Linux and compile a PHP binary. Then you have to build your bootstrap file. Then you zip those two things together. Then you use the CLI to publish that, the AWS CLI, I should say, to publish that to a Lambda layer and you apply that layer to your Lambda function. And of course, you also upload your Lambda function code and apply that as well. Um, and this is some screenshots of me doing that exact thing, right? So I'm compiling PHP version 7.3 in uh, Linux. I'm including some extensions. So here's my SQLI. I'm zipping those two things together. And I'm using the AWS command line interface to upload that or create a Lambda layer from that. And here I'm, uh, I'm applying that Lambda layer to my uh, Lambda function. And that's all I need to do to then write PHP for my Lambda function. I can do something similar for managing libraries and dependencies. So here I'm installing Composer and I'm installing the AWS SDK for PHP in a Linux machine. I'm then zipping them up into something called vendor.zip and I use the CLI to publish a layer called uh, vendor. 
And here you can see a um, screenshot from my Lambda console where I have two layers on my Lambda function. The first is my custom runtime, and the second is the layer that holds all the libraries and dependencies. So now I can manage my custom runtime and my dependencies separately if I want to add or update them. And this is an extract from my Lambda function handler where I'm using all of that, all of those things um, to write a Lambda function. So here I'm importing the CDK that I, um, the CDK library for AWS. And here I'm using that imported library inside my handler function. And what this three or four lines of code is doing is actually connecting to a MySQL database using RDS proxy. So inside this Lambda function with PHP, I'm connecting to my uh, RDS database very securely using IAM roles with three lines of code, and that all scales um, without me having to do anything or manage any infrastructure. I mentioned also that you can build Lambda functions as container images, and this is great if you're already very familiar with container tooling or if your organization has already invested heavily with containers. This is a good uh, kind of pathway into serverless. It's a little bit different. You create your Docker file and um, you run a Docker build on your Docker file and your bootstrap file and your Lambda function code all together. You then um, you have your Docker image and you upload that to the Amazon Elastic Container Registry and you apply that to your Lambda function. And here is an example of a Docker file that's doing all the same things as my uh, Linux commands earlier. So here I'm installing my required version of PHP. I'm including all the extensions that I want to use. I'm installing Composer all in the same Docker file. I'm copying the bootstrap. And here I'm, I'm managing my dependencies. And finally, I'm setting the entry point to my Lambda function. So if you're more familiar with using Docker files and Docker images, this might be a, a nicer way for you to jump into Lambda. Now, if you don't want to be making Docker files or run it, compiling PHP in Linux, but you want to try out PHP with serverless, there's a really good option for you. And this is to use an open source runtime for PHP. And it's called Breath. And this is not built by AWS. This is built by uh, the community, but it's already quite mature. It's about three years old already, I think. And it's got a really uh, well-engaged community that are constantly updating it. It's the closest thing to a um, supported runtime for PHP in Lambda. And it's really easy to use, right? So you would go over to the Breath website, you would find your required flavor of PHP. So here I found PHP 7.3, and you find the ARN, the Amazon resource uh, name, and you just uh, grab that and apply it to your Lambda function. So this is essentially using a custom uh, runtime provided by uh, a third party, an open source runtime. And then I can just go ahead and build my Lambda function in PHP. I don't have to worry about any of the other Linux commands. And so Breath actually does some really clever things. It has one runtime in particular, it's called PHP FPM. And this uses the fast CGI process manager, which traditionally used in servers like Nginx and Apache to manage inbound requests at high loads. And Breath's implementation of FPM takes care of so many very useful things for you. One of the things it does is that make sure to run each HTTP request as a new process, which is one of the foundations of PHP's share nothing execution model. Um, it also populates global variables that you're used to using like get and post, and you can access that inside your Lambda function then. And it provides a mechanism for PHP scripts to return an HTTP response rather than the default JSON response. And most PHP frameworks are already built using these PHP FPM features. So it makes it a really good runtime to transition from you know, traditional server hosting to serverless applications. Um, and this is how it works. So you use API Gateway to receive the HTTP request from a browser. HTTP, H, blah, blah, blah. API Gateway then invokes Lambda. And the Lambda function uh, environment executes the bootstrap for the breath-based runtime. Breath then converts the HTTP requests from API gateway format into the fast CGI format. And the breath bootstrap calls PHP FPM through this fast CGI protocol. PHP FPM then runs the PHP handler and returns its response. And the breath bootstrap converts the fast CGI response to the API gateway format. 
And finally, Breath returns the response to API Gateway, which returns the HTTP response back to the client. So I've mentioned there are three different ways to build a PHP Lambda function. How do you know which one to choose? I tend to think of it like this. So if you go for the zip um, archive option, you're, you're literally entering commands into Linux that you're then um, compiling your version of PHP and zipping it up and uploading it. So you have so much control over exactly what kind of custom runtime you want to build. If you want to get started really quickly with a reliable production ready runtime without um, fiddling about in Linux, then you should go directly to Breath and try uh, some of their runtime, such as the PHP uh, runtime. Now in the middle, you have container images, um, which is great if you're already familiar with uh, building container images and Docker files, or if your company is already kind of invested in that. But there's something also a huge advantage to this is that you can upload Lambda functions of up to 10 gig. Normally Lambda functions are limited to 250 megs. So this is a, a massive um, gain if you want to upload big functions, which is um, less common, but sometimes still a, a useful requirement for people. So coming back to our serverless LAMP stack, have Lambda, API Gateway, MySQL, and PHP. But I tend to think of it like this because this is the direction that an HTTP request comes into your application. It comes from the browser to API Gateway. API Gateway then uh, is the event that invokes your Lambda function. You have PHP running on Lambda and you have MySQL running on Amazon Aurora. And all of those services are running in your AWS account. And Amazon Aurora is nice and safe behind a VPC. What you can do then is you can have every single request routed directly to Amazon API Gateway, and Amazon API Gateway route that request to one single Lambda function which holds your entire application code for business logic. Then in that application business logic, you would have your traditional router.php, which decides based on uh, the, the, the HTTP request, which controller or model or view to then go ahead and, and run just like building a traditional um, LAMP stack application. So what you have here is you're running Lambda as a scalable web host. So one way of thinking about this is um, to compare it to the sort of traditional Apache 2 config file where you set the directory that your code runs in, and then in that directory, you set an HTTP access file which tells it where index.php is. Now we have a really similar thing happening on the other side here where we just set two rules to say any inbound request from API Gateway send to this one Lambda function. And that Lambda function has all the same business logic as the traditional way of building your PHP application. And it scales automatically. You don't have to add additional servers or manage any of the infrastructure. So if you're gonna build an application like that with one Lambda function to hold your entire application, something to be aware of is the Lambda pricing model. So Lambda charges per request and per duration at the given memory allocation. So what that means is that it's ideal for handling requests for dynamic compute, but it's less efficient at serving static content like CSS files or JavaScript files or images. For this, you could um, set up a rule to route anything for static content, for example, something held in uh, slash assets to an S3 bucket. And the S3 bucket is then a much more efficient way of serving back that static content. What you can do for even further gains is to place a um, content delivery network such as CloudFront in front of all of those requests. So um, a content deli delivery network is uh, a large scale global network that provides secure and scalable delivery of content by caching data at points all over the globe. Essentially, it's bringing uh, that data closer to your user. So that's reducing latency, it's improving the user experience, um, and it's saving you money as well because you're not running Lambda processing power to serve static content that doesn't need any processing. And you can run traditional applications like Laravel and Symfony uh, uh, frameworks in this way. It's very well documented on Breath actually how to set up a Laravel or a Symfony ap application which uses this exact infrastructure. 
Another way of running a serverless application uh, with PHP is to use multiple services or multiple Lambda functions for a, an event-driven microservice. So here, I have a front-end application which will make requests to a resource generated by API Gateway. So for example, slash API. This will then route that request and invoke a Lambda function. So I have a request for slash API slash map, which goes to this Lambda function. And I set that routing rule inside of API Gateway. This Lambda function might then process that request using PHP. It might need to get or set something in my relational database. Now let's say I have a, another request that goes API slash user. This Lambda function can then do something entirely different. It can put an event on your Amazon event bridge, uh, which is a serverless event bus, or something to slash API slash search, which gets routed to a different Lambda function, which can add something to your, uh, your queue, or to API slash activity, which can start a step function workflow. The idea here is that you're producing lots of much smaller Lambda functions, which have much more limited scope, and then they're all able to scale according to their own individual demand. Because remember, all of these services are serverless. So this serverless microservice model that I just mentioned has been embraced by lots of different companies and development teams. And one such story uh, is by a company called Enoptia. And Enoptia is a startup founded in 2014, and they specialize in energy consulting and brokerage. And in 2017, they built a SaaS platform for energy bill management and deployed that on AWS Lambda functions that ran PHP using the BREF runtime. So this service architecture resulted in a cost reduction of more than 54% within three months. And they had uh, almost 10,000 Lambda function invocations running all at the same time, and their platform performance also improved. Um, workloads previously that were taking two hours to complete were now running within 10 minutes, and they also saw an impact, which is um, something less expected, on general team happiness, as well as gains in their cost and scalability. So their smaller development didn't have a dedicated ops or sysad person, but using the serverless managed architecture meant the team of developers could just focus on building and coding and not worry about infrastructure. So there's a link here to their CEO talking you through this infrastructure um, and how they went and, and implemented it on YouTube. So how do you get started? Where should you go next? And my advice is to start with a framework. And the best, I think, framework for this particular um, kind of application is to use the AWS CDK or Cloud Development Kit. So this enables you to define your cloud resources and your infrastructure using all the power of a programming language um, and all the supporting tools that you use during development. So the main power of CDK is that it allows you to create these reusable and shareable cloud abstractions that are called constructs. And these are like high level components and they're really important for best practices and they can be used and stitched together to give you a good starting point or uh, position to further customize your application. And the reason I'm talking about this is because there is already a CDK construct library for the serverless LAMP stack. This is an open source abstraction that offers a high single level component to define all those resources that we've just been talking about. So here you can see there's two constructs, one for a Laravel application running on Lambda behind an API gateway URL. And you can connect this then to the other construct, which creates a, um, a VPC and an Aurora uh, relational database that's running MySQL. And the way to do this is that you create your directory for the AWS CDK and a Laravel project. You create the new Laravel project um, with the Docker command, and you install the Bref and the Bref Laravel bridge packages in the vendor directories. The best way to, to go about doing this is to look at the, um, the, the setting up guide on that, this link here if, if you're interested in using the CDK. What you can then do is initialize uh, the AWS CDK project, and this one's using TypeScript, and you can install the CDK LAMP stack with uh, NPM, and here you can see I have uh, two important directories. One is the template directory that defines all the cloud resources. And the other is my Laravel application, to be more familiar to you. 
But here's an example of that CDK template in action. So it's being used to deploy a serverless Laravel application into Lambda. This is that template file. It's written in TypeScript. Uh, at the top here, I import the CDK library and the construct for the serverless LAMP stack. And as part of the constructor, I provide the breadth runtime and the path to my Laravel code base. And then I deploy it with the CDK CLI deploy command. And that takes a few seconds to run. And then the output here provides me with the new API gateway URL that when I click on serves up my um, boilerplate Laravel application directly from a single Lambda function. So where do you go next? There's some great resources out there for you to jump straight into this. Uh, there is a six part blog series on the AWS serverless blog, which goes into great detail about everything I've just uh, covered. You can get to that from st12.com slash lamp resources. There's also a GitHub page, which is a community cur uh, curated list of resources. You've got articles, case studies, talks, tools, um, all sorts of videos and events of people talking about PHP and serverless. Uh, there's a link for that there. And also you have um, this, this website created by the developer advocate team at AWS called Serverless Land. And it's for everything serverless at AWS essentially. Um, and you can uh, look at the learning path for serverless and PHP if you go to s12d.com slash learn dash PHP. So to recap, the traditional LAMP stack does not scale very well, but with serverless technologies, PHP developers can build scalable web applications without managing infrastructure. You can build decoupled microservices for backend applications. You can use your existing uh, PHP frameworks like Laravel and Symfony, and you can move from prototype to production really quickly. You can either compile your own runtime or use an open source layer, such as Breath. You can build serverless applications with PHP. People are doing it um, all over the place. And I really recommend that you have a look at that uh, GitHub resource to see some case studies of how other people have started shifting from PHP to serverless and the benefits that they, that they saw as a result of that. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, happy to take any questions if you guys have any at all. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, we've got quite a few questions, I think. Uh, let me just read out the first ones. I, I wonder, actually, um, we've got, th uh, Lee, we've got three from Mark. If Mark's happy, should we just bring him into the... Yeah. Are you happy with that, Mark? I can tell from the questions, he knows way more about anything than I do. So it'd be better, better direct from you, I think, Mark. Good evening. Okay. Hello. Just need to bring the questions back up here. I'm not going to see what I've written <laughs> in the questions and answers panel. Uh, let me play them back to you. Okay. Um, so, um, a lot of people have been experimenting with Docker over the last I don't know, five years, running things in ECS and Kubernetes and so forth. And it kind of seems to me that this might um, be like an evolution of that. So, um, maybe serverless will replace Docker containers running in EKS. And um, I wondered what your opinion on that was. Yeah, it's, it's a good point, really. Um, I, I never really got into Docker. I kind of jumped over that and went straight to serverless about three years ago. So it, it, it's a whole gap in my um, sort of evolution, I suppose. And a lot of people have spoken about serverless as the next step after, after containers. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, a sort of modern application tends to use both. Um, so you might use serverless for an application that has sort of invariable 
levels of traffic or unpredictable traffic where you need to scale up and down on demand. And you might use containers for an application that needs you know, a certain amount uh, pre-provisioned for like constant traffic that's at sort of high speed. So I wouldn't say necessarily that serverless is you know, ready to replace containers, but rather the story will, will be that they will kind of work more together. And the, the ability to create a Lambda function with a container image was only introduced in November of last year, just at the end of the year. So the idea behind that is that we're seeing that customers are using both and they've already invested, uh, business have already invested lots of money in this container tooling in the last five years. And they're being told, hey, now you need to go serverless. Um, whereas um, what, what's better to kind of bring these two technologies together in, in some ways is to use that container tooling to create Lambda functions. Um, and then they can kind of exist together, I suppose. So it really depends what kind of workload you're trying to build for. Thanks. Um, we're actually using a mix currently. Um, it's going to be something that will be interesting to see how it proceeds. Mm. I, uh, I didn't know about the last thing and um, it's, it's good to know about that now. So my second question was, um, given the dynamic scaling from a serverless application, and um, you mentioned using the likes of RDS with Aurora, how would you handle um, scaling the related RDS resources under the hood? Like if you use Dynamo, DynamoDB, for example, it's, it's kind of built to be scaleless and you can just keep scaling, but um, RDS is more fixed. So is, is there a way of working with that? Yes, so the, the, the closest thing we have to a scalable relational database is, um, is RDS, uh, Aurora RDS with RDS proxy. So that, uh, that pool of connections is what helps to make your, your database more, more scalable. Um, but Definitely, if you can use DynamoDB, um, that's truly serverless, um, and that works much better with serverless applications. Um, but you know, some people are not comfortable with that way of, of uh, saving information, and, and it's a very different way of building out an application. Um, so both, again, both exist kind of together. I would say if your data doesn't have to be relational, then use DynamoDB for sure. If there is a, a sort of relational element to your data, then um, it's probably better to use RDS, a database with RDS proxy. So I can understand connection pooling, but still when it hits the database engine under the hood, after a certain amount of um, queries, it would effectively use all the resource and have a, a bottleneck in your application. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a, an, a challenge that is not completely solved is having a, a truly scalable uh, relational database. They actually um, launched Aurora Serverless 2 um, in November, which I think goes some ways to solving that. Uh, it's not something I've uh, played with much, but that have you looked at that already? No, it, it would be neat if they've invented something where it can dynamically scale resource based on usage. But I've not heard of that yet in, in, um, in like um, relational databases. I hope I'm wrong and there is something. Yeah, I mean, you've you've hit the nail on the head, really. That's that's still that's still the next challenge to completely solve, and that's why you always see people talking about serverless with DynamoDB, um, and people tend not to approach the relational database kind of question uh, too much. Yeah. My last question, and I'll stop hogging the questions then, is. Um, What's the optimal way for developers working um, with serverless Lambda? So you're writing your code on your local machine. How would you work with the Lambdas with your code constantly changing? How would you work with the Lambda code changing? Locally. So without deploying the Lambda and seeing the results um, in AWS infrastructure, how could you work as a developer with your iterations of code and so forth? Right. Um, well, there's something called uh, Lambda, sorry, SAM local which um, you can use to uh, locally invoke, basically it uses Docker to kind of emulate a little bit the Lambda environment to locally invoke your Lambda functions. There's also something new since November called the uh, Lambda Runtime Interface Emulator, um, which again allows you to essentially bring Lambda 
uh, um, runtime to your or Lambda execution environment to your machine to really even further emulate how your Lambda functions would uh, respond to different implications. Um, so again, it's kind of a hybrid of testing what you can locally using SAM local and then testing uh, in the cloud, ideally in a, another um, uh, like a um, developer account is the way some uh, companies do it. Um, yeah, you, you, do, you do get into a problem of trying to bring all the services to your local machine, which is not the, the best route to go. So ideally you test your sort of business logic locally, and then you test the application um, in the cloud, essentially. There's a really good call, uh, tool called SLS Dev Tools. Dev, I'll put it in there. Um, SLS Dev Tools, which um, I always use when I'm building um, applications. So this is a, a terminal tool that you have running in the background, and you can use it to invoke your Lambda functions directly from this kind of dashboard, and you can see your your errors and your logs in the terminal as you're coding or in your IDE as you're coding. So it saves you switching between, I don't know, CloudWatch logs and other places. Um, and there's more and more uh, tools like this coming out because this is the next kind of challenge is the, the developer experience from, from local to cloud and testing and how can you iterate quickly. We're using a tool called Telepresence currently, but it, it works with the Kubernetes cluster. So oh, right. I guess it's translating that into the serverless lambda world. It, it basically yeah. creates a socket between the remote Kubernetes cluster and you can just develop locally, but in the remote cluster, which is pretty cool. What's that one called? Telepresence. Okay. I'll write it in the chat. Yeah, it's called Really enjoyed your talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, well, I've just got to find the questions. Uh, question from from Dan. What does Lambda PHP not do very well? I what use cases would it not be appropriate? For? Um, so it would not be appropriate for serving large kind of static files, videos, images, um, anything that doesn't need computation. Um, avoid that. Um, avoid using generally serverless is less uh, efficient at um, workloads that, that are predictable, that have a predictable level of traffic and a predictable um, amount of resources that might be allocated, right? So um, it's not the answer to everything. I, I we tend to see that where it's best is if you have an event-driven application, something where, I don't know, you have a, a cron job running that needs to trigger something. That's great for uh, a serverless Lambda function or an event, say, um, a webhook that you need to then trigger something in Lambda. This is the way to start building, in my opinion, service applications is not to dump your existing or, or port your existing uh, um, monolith or your existing application into a Lambda function, but the next, take the next thing that you can build that has a kind of small glass radius and, and build that with serverless, with PHP and Lambda and learn the kind of paradigm, learn some of the nuances, Mark, uh, mentioned some there about um, sort of developing locally and how do you test and stuff in, in the cloud. Do that with something small and event-based, and then you can kind of iterate that out and you start to see that quite quickly um, your application, because it's such an enjoyable way of building, because you're just you're just focused on building and not any of the infrastructure. Suddenly your, your application starts, you start to see where you can make other gains in, in serverless. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned breath. Is that yeah. a, that's is that something AWS? Is that AWS written or is that? No, it's not AWS. So breath is made by a guy called Matthew Napoli, who is a PHP whiz. Um, I imagine some of the people here might have seen him talk at other uh, meetups and stuff. He um, he started off this custom runtime for PHP um, in Lambda. And now it has a, a, a huge community. If, if you Google custom runtime PHP, breath probably be the, the only result that comes up. 
Um, and there's so much great documentation, not just on how you run PHP with Lambda, but you know, that's serverless, but from a PHP developer's mindset, um, because that's where those guys uh, come from. And uh, I think it really is the closest thing to a natively supported runtime for PHP and Lambda. Um, I've, I've tried it out in all sorts of different ways myself. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's the best way to get started, I think, if you, if you don't want to kind of uh, get your hands dirty with compiling PHP and, and, and zipping up Lambda functions. And then perhaps once you've you know, used Breath to, to build a PHP Lambda function, you might look at how you can build your own custom runtime, something a bit more lightweight. Yeah. So, I mean, do AWS sponsor that kind of project? Is that? No. No, that's completely no. community driven. Um, we have a thing called uh, Heroes, like Community Heroes. Yeah, um, yeah. And Matthew, I think, became a community hero just last year because of all the efforts. But um, all that means is that he's invited to uh, hear about the roadmap and stuff like that and to sort of talk. Uh, you know, he gets more information about uh, the future, I suppose, in some mm -hmm. ways. But but no, it's not, it's not sponsored by AWS at all. It's completely um, open source um, driven. Okay, so uh, another question uh, we've got is, it's great that AWS is building really powerful uh, deployment environments uh, based on open source software. Uh, to make this sustainable, where can open source projects apply for funding and sponsorship from AWS? Mm. I'm not sure about that. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't. I, that's a really, that's a really great question. I can find out and, and um, get back to you. Yeah, if you would, and we can yeah. we can just uh, tweet tweet that answer. Yeah, um, I'll do that. Tweet that answer out. I mean, I, you know, it's it's a it's a big thing, isn't it? You've got you've got some companies who are doing incredibly well out of what they're doing, and then you've got you know these open source developers who are working all hours just to develop stuff and it's, it's kind of working out how you know how you suppose you know those open source developers who do want some funding for their project how do they how do they get back i've lost you know, your day uh, you're frozen oh i'm frozen am i you're back oh can you hear me now yeah, i'm back it's yeah it's because i'm asking it's because i'm asking difficult questions isn't it yeah no i mean i suspect there's this this common problem with um with open source in that you have got, uh, oh, I'm back, still here? Yeah, we're still um, got I've still got me, yeah, sorry. And it's common probably you've got, you know, I mean, you've got some open source developers that are pretty prolific in their outputs. And, you know, without it, the whole PHP ecosystem just wouldn't be there. You know, you've got your core PHP developers, you've got your, so, you know, Sebastian Bergman, PHP unit and things like that. And I suppose it's just, wondering how you've got other organizations that are doing pretty well out of it you know by the infrastructure that's provided and it's how those open source developers can you know can can apply for funding so it'd be it'd be very interesting if you could uh, get back to us on on how they can you know uh, apply for money from aws or similar and uh, and we can we can certainly tweet that around well uh, yeah I'll, I'll look into it yeah Okay, thank you. Um, so I've got a few other questions uh, from Glenn. How do, uh, oh, okay, I think we've sort of talked about this actually. Um, how do you maintain environment parity for local live and everything? Uh, this is why I'm leaning towards Fargate if we choose to move to AWS. So if you, if you want to really make sure your local environment is the same, then probably the best way to go is to use your uh, Docker image file, um, because then you have complete control over it. Um, essentially, it's a different mindset for building there. You, 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 don't, you don't build in the same way where you have a local version of your application that you then upload to AWS. You have a template file, which holds all your AWS resources. Um, and you might have a, um, uh, a development account or a development um, yeah, account is the right word, where you upload your, your dev version of the, um, of the application and you test the dev version there. And you test maybe the business logic locally, but you don't necessarily um, have a local environment parity with your 
with your cloud environment. You have different cloud environments. Okay. And and it definitely a, a different mindset when you first start building in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to come back on the answers, just just pop them back in the Q and A. Um, but we'll move on. Uh, Rich uh, asks, how would you approach splitting a monolithic application uh, to microservice slash Lambda functions? Yeah, so I, I uh, wrote a whole blog post on this. Um, so I can share the link with you. Uh, essentially, yeah, this is a huge, a huge topic, really, um, splitting a monolith into a microservice. But the best way to do it, really, is to take a slice like I said before, which is um, a kind of a smaller impact if something goes wrong, I suppose, something that you can isolate um, and to start from that um, and learn the kind of um, the paradigm of, of serverless using that and kind of iterate out from there. Um, I'll, I'll share with you the, the, the blog post series that explains exactly the sort of steps to take on how to do that. But of course, it's different for every application because um, obviously no application is, is the same as the next. Cool, thank you. Um, uh, we've got another question. What would be the deployment pipeline with this architecture? Okay, so you can use, um, uh, what's it called? Um, <laughs> there's an L. Mine's gone blank. There's a code star. There's a whole Amazon um, deployment uh, tool pipeline that you can use directly, which obviously integrates uh, really easily. For some reason, the names totally escaped me. Um, but people use things like Circle CI. People use GitHub Actions. Um, there's uh, Amplify. There's there's all sorts of different tools which. Um, integrate really nicely and, and you know it's it's already quite a uh, a mature um, area so the server's been about for about seven years now so that's one problem or one challenge which has kind of been solved already um, so there's a whole um, again a whole blog series on um, deploying with serverless which I got have a lot of links to share with you don't I after this uh, yeah if you if you pop them all in chat and then we we can tweet them out as well to everyone at the end uh, yeah, so that'd be um, that'd be great. Uh, another question we've got: Is this what uh, Laravel Vapor is using? Ah, so no, Laravel Vapor is using its own thing. Um, I don't know exactly what they use, but essentially, that's uh, that's a serverless version of, of Laravel. It's definitely going to be uh, using similar infrastructure. And then you pay, uh, a, a, I guess, an, a little bit extra because they put it all together for you. But what you're able to do with this is to create your own version of Laravel uh, Vapor, if you like, your own service version of Laravel without that extra um, cost of, of uh, the Laravel team setting that up for you. But Laravel Vapor is really good. It has its own uh, dashboard. It's a little bit more managed. It's almost like an extra level of serverless because Again, even the, the setup is managed for you, if you like. Code pipeline and code deploy were the, the, the two um, CI, CD deployment tools, by the way. I'm just coming through to see if there's any more questions. Uh, if anyone has got any or any follow-ups, just post those. So there was in. one thing I saw that said um, AWS is, is expensive for the small guy or something. Um, so, the, oh yeah, not cheap for the small person. So I would challenge that one because of I mean, it depends how small we're talking, really, I suppose. Um, but the way I got into serverless before joining AWS was um, was trying all, building all sorts of applications with serverless for free because the, the free model is so 
vast that you can um, you can go a long way into it before you actually have to uh, sort of hit the payment um, levels of using things like Lambda and API Gateway and pretty much everything. You can start learning this without really having to pay more than a few pennies. Um, but then I, I suppose if you start scaling out the application into production, then that's when that's when it starts to change. But certainly for learning how to build service applications and all the different workshops and different tutorials that you'll find on certainly from AWS on building with serverless, it shouldn't really cost you much at all. That was from me, Ben, actually. And um, my experience was um, it's all very well if you're wanting to use something like ECT or run some containers or lambdas. But if you want to run a database or an Elasticsearch instance or something like that, it gets expensive very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a different point. It gets expensive quickly. I understand that. Yeah, that's when you, you need to put in safeguards and alarms and stuff so that you don't accidentally uh, hit that. Yeah. However, DynamoDB is cheap as chips. I love it. Right. I had one, one more question I wanted to ask if that's okay. So um, in traditional old school world, you'd have your instance of say Apache or Nginx before PHP FPM and you'd use something like mod rewrite to rewrite the URLs and maybe, I don't know, even filter them with some like um, web firewall, for example. How would you handle that kind of thing if all the requests were just going straight to API Gateway? Well, API Gateway has um, the ability to uh, root and re rewrite um, requests natively as well and you can configure that in API Gateway. So one of the good things is that you're not doing that with, uh, with code, so it's easier to manage. You're actually doing that in the service configuration. This you're, is something I'm going to have to go have a go with. It yeah, that, that's one of the main benefits, really, is because you're reducing the amount of code that you have to kind of uh, manage. Okay, uh, we had a follow-up question from Glenn. So we've we've added it in. So uh, Glenn, if you just take yourself off mute and you can ask away. Hello. Um, yeah, so I guess my question was, uh, yeah, so I like to keep environment parity between everything I use, so whether it's local, stage, prod, pre-prod, UAC, whatever you have. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate it's a different paradigm that, you know, uh, serverless is not, Lamp stack, um, I tend to use something like either Vagrant or Docker for whatever I use these days, pretty much Docker. Um, but yeah, how would I, how would the setup look locally? Uh, so say we do migrate everything over to AWS via Lambda. Um, yeah, how would local development look? You know, how would I test requests? How would I test, you know, uh, from everything from going from a request through my application, uh, you know, all of that through the database um, and actually get, getting a page result. So I appreciate it. it's a different mindset. You know, you've uh, you said Lambda is not LAMP. It isn't. Um, but what would my local development environment look like? So you would have um, a, a template file, which would be either a, a YAML file or a CDK, for example, TypeScript which would hold these definitions for your AWS resources. So that would hold um, the configuration for your Lambda function, for your API gateway, maybe for your S3 bucket and for your um, cloud front. And then uh, you mm -hmm. would have a separate <clears throat> directory which would hold your entire uh, um, PHP application. And that directory, if you're using the FPM um, runtime, that directory would be what's referenced by your single Lambda function. And you can test that locally, just like you test any other PHP application, if you like. Or you can use something called SAM local, which is a command line um, interface for sending HTTP requests um, to your Lambda function. And it uses Docker to kind of emulate the Lambda runtime environment. And then you can see what would be earned from your Lambda function. So what you're really doing is just testing the business logic, the Lambda function at that point. Everything else that you want to test, you would do it in your um, in your account in a uh, developer account. So, so we have the the, the SAM CLI. Would that account for 
stapleness. So if I'm testing an a end-to-end user journey, so going from uh, you know an affiliate link or direct traffic uh, to your basket, check out, what have you, is that, you know, can you still do that with the SAM CLI? No, the SAM CLI is just testing the invocation to your Lambda function. So you'd have to work out what is the payload that would be sent to your Lambda function. And that's what you provide in the SAM CLI uh, local kind of test. So that's, so, so you're literally just testing that, that little part of your application, the business logic. So I think mean, that's, that's what I'm missing. So I will, uh, yeah, obviously we are working with discrete units of work, but ultimately as a developer, you are going to be, uh, when you make uh, when you make a change, fix a bug, create a new feature, you are going to be testing a full-on journey, not just discrete units of functionality, of, you know, literally request response. It is a chain or a sequence of request responses with that stateless. Yeah. So it sounds like we'll still need that Docker or Vagrant setup or what have you, uh, uh, LAMP basically. <laughs> well, if you want to test the entire application, all the resources, yeah. the API gateway, the whole request all the way through, again, like the difference is you, you, you don't do that bit locally. You do that bit in a dev account. Uh, I do it locally too. I mean, it, it saves a no. board minutes. <laughs> sure. But that, that's yeah. that's one of the that's one of the shifts, I suppose. Yeah, in, in using serverless. Yeah, I just uh, yeah, I just try to yeah, obviously for for a business case, uh, obviously I've got to try and present a CMD. Um, whether we go, so I think Fargate might be the best choice for what we're doing because we have that Docker setup, you know, and I guess Fargate is the what well, Fargate is serverless, but yeah, just trying to work out how how it would look locally so that we can still maintain that uh that workflow of you know you do it locally you don't necessarily have to commit push wait for a build and then there you go go test it it's a test it locally a bit more rapid rapid location development kind of stuff yeah if, what, does, that, what, does that make sense or i um no it makes uh, sense what what you might want to do is look for the other model where you have like <clears> the <throat> services model where the front end of your website is built in a different something else um you know maybe node or maybe that is, is a, a whole different um, part of your application. And then you use yep. the event driven part, you know, to, to make requests to your serverless backend. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then doing that, you can test the whole thing locally. It kind of makes sense, but that sounds like it's a, that's another headache. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think the, the important thing for me is having that absolute environment parity so that it doesn't matter where we're testing it it just works anywhere i can test it here test it there test it on the toaster um so i guess so would you recommend fargate that kind of thing if we do already have a docker setup rather yeah, than lambda it sounds like that fits better what you're what you're after yeah okay yeah and no, i'm just trying to picture how it uh so i guess what a traditional development workflow would look like in a Lambda situation, you know, if, if you want sure. to still be kind of traditional, a bit old school, uh, I guess you would have a Lambda stack locally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll have a look into the SAM CLI, because that could be... Uh, yeah, I've not investigated too much into Lambda, so... Uh, I know what it is, but not, obviously, how to use it day-to-day, -day, so... Yeah, Try out appreciate your that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, I appreciate it. I do have some time allocated for this kind of stuff, so... Yeah, appreciate it anyway. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for that fantastic talk. Um, really, really interesting. Thank you.